<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Hey everybody and welcome back to Eggs. This week we have Emmy Award winning camera operator turned entrepreneur, Howie Zales. With more than 25 years of television experience, Howie created HJZ Productions in 2000 to address the need for professional sports broadcasting crew and staff in the New York market. Under his leadership, HJZ grew and became a nationwide provider of top talent in broadcasting and a multi-million dollar organization. In 2019, Howie formed a new company, Veridity Entertainment Services, or VES, with a primary focus on broadcast staffing in non-union markets. However, in response to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020, they rapidly pivoted to become a provider of best-in-class broadcast quality live streaming solutions for sports shows and interviews, corporate events, and religious services. Additionally, Howie launched the much-acclaimed TV Sports Course, a hands-on boot camp designed to train the next generation of television production professionals. Joining us today for a conversation about the lessons learned in 25 years of entertainment production, where live stream broadcast events figure into our post-pandemic landscape, the experience of building not just one, but two very successful organizations, and so much more. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Howie Zales. Hey, Howie, how are you? How are you guys doing? Uh, doing very great. well, thank you. Thanks so much for taking the time to, uh, to do the show today. We're really excited to have this conversation. All right, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Cool. Well, let's just, I guess, sort of start at the beginning and uh, let's talk a little bit about where you come from and uh, just sort of, you know, maybe a little bit more about who you are and how you've sort of began your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, sure. I, I was born and raised in, just outside of New York City, and uh, I grew up a huge sports fan, mainly uh, baseball. And so I knew that or I wanted to play professional baseball. That was my goal. Uh, but I knew I needed a backup. So in 11th grade, I I saw that there was a selective uh, in high school trip to NBC studios, uh, watch a, a TV show being taped and a tour of NBC and 30 rock. And I was like, how bad can that be? Right. That sounds like an easy a. And uh, immediately I fell in love with TV production. And um, I knew that in 11th grade that I had to combine my new love of TV and my original passion of baseball and sports into one. Uh, I grew up going to, you know, Rangers games, Knicks games, Yankees, Mets. I always watched the camera operators. Uh, so I just knew right away that that's what I was meant to be. And I applied to colleges that had TV production programs. And that was kind of like the beginning. Nice. I love that you kind of realized at a young age that that's what you wanted to do because a lot of people stumble into it. And the the fact that you're proactive and went to college and actually like this is what I want to do, went down the route and planned it and got there is is great. Can you talk about like your first gig where where you, you know where you got hired, the yeah. first few years of figuring it out because uh, you know doing working with electronics and working with like audio and video and everything like that. There's a lot of like stuff that you have to learn on the job versus just college will teach you a little bit, but the stuff you learn on the job is the stuff that really matters. No, you, you couldn't, you hit the nail on the head. I started off um, as a production assistant on a small company on Long Island. And then I took a job shooting television news with a reporter in the field. I, I just didn't know how to get into television sports. Uh, so I was at this NBC affiliate in upst upstate New York for about a year. Uh, I learned a lot about shooting, how to shoot news and how to frame shots and, and all that. And then um, everyone knew that I wanted to do TV sports and I would shoot um, sports highlights for the sports department as well. Um, so one day ESPN called the newsroom and said they were doing a university of vermont men's basketball game they needed one more camera operator could they recommend someone and so you know absolutely <laughs> i'll be there at 10 <laughs> i'll be there just tell me where and when right um so I, I got that first job and i met uh one of my would become one of my mentors his name is ted and uh that one job because I did, I did a really good job. I was a little clueless in what I was doing, but I gave 110%, became a second job and then became a third job. And fast forward a few months where my freelance, my television news career was getting in the way of my freelance career. 
I was having to turn down jobs because I had this commitment and um, I weighed how much money I needed uh, to make. And I, I set set a date and said, this is, we're going to leave my full-time job and I'm going to become a full-time freelance uh, camera operator. Yeah. No, I love, I love that story. I mean, you know, it, like Mike was saying at the beginning, I, so both Mike and I come from a world of music, right? And so we, you know, they, I just went, I saw the black keys the other night and I was, you know, right up front and I was, I'm checking out all the speakers and how they've hung the arrays and, you know, how is they, Oh, they've run the, you know, they've got these cameras set up everywhere. You know, like, I mean, I was intrigued by the production myself. I always worked more on the management side of music, but Mike is a, a professional DJ and an audio performer and he's hosted a lot of events and things. And so this technical thing, I think we can sort of, I don't know, share parallel interests and that kind of stuff. So Absolutely. It's really, really fun to hear your story. Also, um, I just kind of want to call out or make a point about that willingness to raise your hand. I think that that uh, is is a trait that, you know, young people could really be grabbing onto, which is this idea that, you know, raise your hand and be ready. And now, granted, you were chasing a passion, but I mean, I think by being the hand up guy most of the time, you find these opportunities that then beget the better opportunities. So I think it's great. So, yeah. And as long as, as long as you're honest about your skill set, but you're willing to take that shot and take that chance. I think will only, you know, help you fail forward. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Well, and I mean, like you mentioned with, with skills or, or being willing to take that chance, but especially with live broadcast, man, you really are, you know, I mean, there, there are some stakes there, right? I mean, you can mess things up and, you know, production can go sideways. So it's really important to do that. And I like that idea of not over, you know, overselling your, your mm -hmm. skill set or, you know, get, promising more than you can deliver. Exactly. So because at least in this business, it's, it's, you know, you've got to deliver on what you say. So can you talk about, I guess, then the, the transition from, you know, super busy freelancer to starting your first business? Uh, I assume it's sort of one begat the other, but I wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, it's a cool story. Uh, I was shooting, you know, all different events every day of the week. And a good friend of mine who I went to uh, everything from elementary school through college together, he was working at MSNBC at the time. And I don't know if you remember Imus in the morning, he would do his radio show from MSNBC in New Jersey. But once in a while, they would take the show on the road. And he said, How Howie, we're going to go do uh, Imus' show at the Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut. Are you available on this date to, to help shoot the show? And I said, sure. And he said, do you have any friends? And I said, he said, I need some camera people, audio people, some utilities. I need a whole crew. And I said, yeah, I could, I could do that. And he said, can you make it easy for me and send me one invoice and just you pay everybody? And I'm like, ding, there's got to be a, a business idea there. And so I, I launched um, HJZ Productions, which became a TV staffing company where we would staff sports and entertainment shows. And we started off really small with just shows in New York, then New Jersey and Connecticut. And we kind of branched out and signed a union contract uh, here in the metro area and then uh, developed the union contracts fast forward to the present day in most cities across the country. Do you um, do you focus mainly on the professional and not the equipment or do you also provide the equipment for the shows? So the, the equipment shows up on. Uh, TV trucks. Um, okay. We can uh, and have rented TV trucks before, but a lot of times uh, we focus, most of the times we focus on the crew because the client will uh, rent the trucks. That's see that. So I've been down a live stream kind of like chasing that dragon for a little while. And I, I mean, like it's essentially the same as doing this podcast right now. I mean, you got to worry about audio, you got to wor worry about lighting the video and everything. And, and granted I'm using a little webcam and you're probably using something similar at the moment, not a, you know, $50,000 camera. But what I found is that, you know, it, um, it's, it's hard to a develop clientele from the ground up that want to pay to where you can actually afford the nice equipment and then go from there to be able to provide both the staffing and the equipment because the equipment's not cheap. And so um, I like that you focused on the staffing and just training the right people how to do it. And then on that scale of things, you know, the, the, the cameras and everything are provided by the client. That, that's, I like yeah. that a lot. So. And um, we did that. That's how kind of my first company, HJZ Productions, that was the business model for that. With Veridity, our live stream business, um, we made uh, a bunch of small investments over the course of time 
and um, we do have a significant amount of cameras uh, equipment now for our live stream business. Um, we have 25 contributor kits. Uh, they're okay. high-end laptops with uh, ring uh, cameras, ring lights, USB microphones that we send out to people that are in our live streams. Um, and the beauty behind that is there are computers so we can dial into the computer through software once it hits the internet, focus the camera, white balance the camera, zoom the camera in or out, um, control the audio levels. Uh, and so it brings a much more professional uh, look and feel to the person's um, camera shot because the books behind them are not in focus. They're actually in focus uh, and they sound good. That's, and, uh, that's, a, that's pretty cool actually being able to, yeah. I mean, like just the thought process of actually, Hey, I'm going to send this to you and then I'm going to take over control. So all you have to do is worry about, uh, a yeah. just getting it set up, but then your conversation, you don't really have to worry about hey, Do I sound good? Do I look good? I'm in focus. You just do that all for them. That's they don't that's, even have to worry about setting it up. We send a, a QR code with the system that shows them pick step by step, picture by picture, and with instructions on what to plug in where the computer's labeled. Um, and then once we see the computer hit the internet in our system, we can uh, dial right in and take full control. They just literally have to mount the camera in the center of the laptop, and then we could walk them through the rest. Um, and this all started in a very funny way. A, a client called and said, hey, Howie, this is during the pandemic. We need to interview nine different major league baseball players in nine cities in nine weeks but the interviewer cannot leave her home. Can you do that for us? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. He's like, great. I hung up the phone. I said to my wife, I said, I have no freaking idea how we're going to do this. <laughs> well, but yeah, uh, no, we figured it out. That's awesome. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's funny because with the rush to sort of work from home and everybody meeting online and stuff, when, the, when uh, as the COVID pandemic came through, um, you know, everybody did run to their, their laptop cams and stuff like that, but there was also a significant decline in like the quality of equipment people were yes. using, you know, I mean, at least if you were in a corporate environment, maybe you have a nice camera in the meeting room or, you know, in the conference room or something. And so you have decent equipment and decent sound for telecommunications and that. And, and now basically, you know, as an individual, you have to become an IT professional and a camera guy and a lighting person. And, you know, you have to try and solve all these problems on your own. So it's really innovative, this idea of sending stuff uh, out, you know, I mean, it seems like, uh, I mean, for me anyway, it seems like a really a smart solution to a problem like this. You know, obviously, I mean, we have, we interview a lot of guests. We do them almost exclusively by Zoom at this point. And, uh, you know, and it's a little hit and miss what you get, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, we certainly don't have control over our guests' computers or anything. So we don't, we don't have that kind of control, but you know, it would sure be nice. And yeah. maybe one day when the show's rich and famous, we can hire somebody like you to run it. But <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And internet speed is like the biggest challenge, right? Uh, for that, at least for us, we always do tech checks two or three days before at the same time we're going to do our productions so we can test out what the internet is going to like be like at that same time. We've actually, we deal with a lot of athletes and things like that. And, um, we we dealt with this one NBA player who said he had the best internet in the world. Well, we need a minimum of a 10 upload, minimum of a 10 upload. We get to his house. We, we send the computer to um, a technician who's going to go into his house, set it up for him. So he doesn't even have to plug it in. We, we take care of everything. He's got a 0 0.02 upload. I mean, it's barely even functioning internet. So we have to rent a hotel hotel room a few miles down the road just to even uh get them into the production so yeah like when when we first started this podcast there was a, a week or two where uh i was going to be on the road and uh i ended up one of the one of the interviews we did i pulled up in my car and parked outside of a hotel <laughs> install the wi-fi to be able to do it and so i'm sitting there in the driver's seat trying to do a podcast and i, I can't remember what show number it was but it was great right. Yeah, no, we had a couple like that. And uh, in fact, we used to have, we used to have a place we called Studio Six, which was actually the Motel Six in <laughs> my house. And we went awesome. down to the Motel Six because we could get in there for like 30 bucks a night or whatever. So we'd go rent the place so that we could do our broadcast from there. So, but we've also done, I mean, Mike was in Nome, Alaska last summer. So we did 12 weeks from Nome. We did, a, you know, and so these challenges are really interesting to overcome. Yeah, I actually travel with a bonded cellular router. 
if I could, as long as I could plug it into AC, you know, I should yeah. have good sales, uh, internet. Well, so let's jump back to your business a little bit and let's talk about just sort of the growth of the organization. So, I mean, you, you know, you told us about your first gig as a sort of, I guess, a professional and, you know, obviously that was kind of whipped together and, and thrown together, but certainly you saw some bones or you saw the, you know, the prospect of, Hey, this could be something we do. You know, can you talk a little bit about just the, I guess, the growing pains of scaling that organization to a point where it was capable of managing, you know, uh, productions across the country and, and you gathering, you know, uh, the talent that would make your company appealing to other people, that kind of thing. Well, and yeah, then also, I mean, um, talk about the, the union process, because I know New York's a little different than others. And I'm yeah. sure that's part of the growth pain that you're going to describe here. So I figured yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a big pain. Uh, so at first I, I, I was a camera op- a traveling camera operator until the la- uh, until maybe about three years ago. I travel four times a week, uh, almost 200,000 air miles a year. Um, so I was doing this business uh, simultaneous to all that. And I was um, making a lot of mistakes. I was working through the night, doing payroll, setting crews up. Uh, the client would call to cancel, you know, a camera person. And if I wasn't in my off home office, I, I wouldn't write it down. I'd forget. So it would cost me money. So I was making a lot of mistakes. So one of the big things it was that I did is I, I had to hire someone to manage the business, uh, the business side of the business to, to kind of be my backup. And then I hired someone to to run the the hiring side of the business because I just couldn't be everywhere and do everything without making mistakes. So once I kind of filled those two two roles, you know, our business kind of took off and really started to gain momentum. And that's when the union in New York came into play in about 2008, 9, 10. Uh, where we basically, our hands were tied. They said, if, if you want to continue operating, you need to sign a union contract. And so we signed a union contract with uh, IATSE um, in, in New York. And basically it, it kind of made things a lot easier because now these are the rates. Everyone gets paid the same. Where If you're a camera operator, these are the rates. If you're an audio person, this is the rates. And it made doing uh, business a lot easier. We just have to abide by certain rules and let the clients know those rules. It's more expensive to do business these days because everyone gets their health and welfare and pension and annuity contributions, but they're employees and they deserve to have to get those. You know, as a someone who has been self-employed in the audio and video and the event industry for 20 years, I can't even begin to tell you how awesome that would feel to be able to do, you know, like the work that I love and actually get benefits with it. Like, holy cow, that'd be amazing. Yeah. (laughs) So I, I, I gotta say, I, I actually, I think I'm a fan of the, the union side of things just because. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask though, how did that work? So it seems like maybe once you're in union, you know, I don't know, maybe you become part of a referral program or maybe, you know, uh, people can look you up as a a union approved vendor or something like that. Maybe that contributes to work. But how were you getting work in the early days? Was it all sort of word of mouth because you're a well-known you know, person in the area who'd been doing this kind of work? Or how did people learn about your business? Yeah, we, you, um, we, I guess one of the first big clients that we had were some New York local companies. Uh, we did some hiring for the Mets, the New York Mets baseball team. Nice. Um, then we got a client, uh, the Snet Sportsnet from Canada. So every time a Canadian hockey team came to play a U.S. hockey team in the New York, New Jersey area, we would do the hiring for them. Because whenever there's a sporting event, right, there's always two feeds going on, a feed for the home team and a feed for the away team. Two completely independent shows with the same amount of ca- – well, the home team always has more cameras, but the away show – has a full setup, full TV crew doing their complete independent show. So we, our company would always handle uh, the away broadcasts. Do you guys, can you tap into the same video cameras and the same? Uh, um, yeah. To answer your question uh, on most sporting events, there are some shared cameras. Okay. Um, especially 
uh, the visiting feed will take some of the home team's cameras that are in places where you can't fit two cameras. So maybe like down the, the left and right field, uh, you know, foul poles or in the dugouts, there's only room for one robotic camera. So that's kind of a shared camera, but the away director cannot speak to the camera operator operating the camera. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so they can't it's a say, little hey, bit of a, over here. Yeah. Okay. It's strictly under the guidance of the home team director. So you take that shot and like, pray that the person doesn't move the camera. So it, <laughs> it's not, it's not used all the time because of that. Huh. Um, so that's actually kind of cool. I, I mean, like I nerd out about this stuff, so I, yeah. I, I'm sure our listeners could care less, but like, <laughs> uh, I, so you have two switchboards and two overlays and two, you know, like everything you're doing, you're, uh, you may be sharing a camera here or there. How many people does it take to do uh, like a video crew and an audio for, for like a baseball game? So each, each show has their own TV truck. Um, most of these trucks are $20 million trucks. Um, there's typically, uh, uh, on a baseball game, there's high home, uh, center field, tight center, low first, low third, high first, high third. And then that's a minimum of seven cameras, but then there's always usually, you know, behind home plate, one or two dugout cameras. I think, uh, maybe a roving handheld camera. Now we're up to like 10, um and then there's three audio people five to seven replay people um a utility or two the the technical director the video person so close to about 20 something people so are you handling all these positions or are you only handling the camera operators no everyone everyone pretty much that i said everyone below the line it's called the director but below the director on down that's awesome. I mean, so yeah. there's, so each, each game, each, well, I'm, I'm sure you do more than just games, but yeah. you're, you're uh, managing up to 25, 30 people. Yeah. Uh, we did a golf event a few weeks ago. We had almost 60, 70 people working for five, six days straight. So uh-huh. that's, that's incredible to me. So like logistically, when you show up with the, the, the roaming camera, for example, do you set up, how does that work? How, how does the, the, the wireless go? Is it all tied in with the truck? Is it tied in? I mean, like did, that yeah. I'm, I'm nerding out. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. There's um, depending on how many cameras there are, like, let's say for the, I always do the Kentucky Derby every year for NBC. So there's a uh, one or two companies nationwide that handle RF coordination and the company that uh, NBC uses is called BSI. They show up with a tractor trailer truck with a pole that is maybe 50 feet high. That's, that's a big antenna more or less. And you can go anywhere around the horse track uh, because you have um, uh, on the back of your camera, you have a pointer that uh, is a transmitter and there's different receive sites around the track that receive the signal okay. and based on where you are is which receive site is being used that's that's, just, that's it that's that's yeah. a, in a nutshell more or less. well it's like a directional antenna for wireless mic yeah. same kind of yeah. thing but on a bigger scale so yes that's, that's pretty cool yeah that's so. really cool um, all right. So can we talk about too? So as, as your organization scaled, you know, obviously now you're managing these, you know, like you were just talking about with the golf pro, uh, event, you were managing 70 people plus or whatever. Um, I mean, certainly your productions didn't start that big. So can you talk about just some of the hurdles that you encountered in trying to staff and trying to find like people you could rely on, believe in, you know, had experience with those sorts of things? Like, cause I know that hiring is a real challenge and you said you filled that role pretty early. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, I think for a lot of people, they sort of, plan to do the hiring on their own for a a long time, especially in in a young startup. So I guess, how did you know to do that? And like, what kind of person is this hiring person? Like, are they a technical person that knows how to hire technical people or were they vetting these individuals in some way? Or like, how does all that sort of staffing work? Yeah. So, well, we have two sets of people, right? We have like the core team and then our freelancers. So the core team is someone that's uh, really close to us. Uh, and when I say us, my wife and I run our businesses together. So she's one of the core members and, um, 
one other person. Uh, so th this person is like a close friend who we've known for a very long time, who I would trust my life with. Um, and then there's the freelance side, the freelancers, and we hire union people. Um, we have to hire off the union list, but then we, there's basically, um, from knowing these people so long, I know the skill sets of a lot of the people of the, a lot of the people that we hire. And then for the newer people and uh, some of the people I don't know, I rely on a few trusted uh, crew members to give me the lowdown on the skill sets of some of the people. And then I always speak to the producer and director of the show or, or the client, whomever. Um, hey, were there any issues on the show? Is there someone that I should look out for? Is there someone that did a really great job that we should be hiring more? Um, so I'm always looking for feedback from the client on who to use more, or who to use less. Yeah, I think that's really smart. Um, do you use, so you said you have to hire union talent. Do you have to do that? Like even when you're, let's say you're working the Kentucky Derby and you've got a crew down there or something or a golf tournament out of state, do you use, uh, hire local or do you bring everybody from New York for the events? So for N NBC, uh, I'm just, for the Kentucky Derby, I'm just one of uh, many camera operators. Uh, yeah, that is all fully unionized. Uh, people travel from all over. But um, yeah, it's union. Everything is pretty much okay. unionized. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just curious how that worked when you're, you know, scaling to an out-of-state kind of reach. Mm. Yeah. So let's there are talk there about are some states oh, that are not non-union or some cities that are non-union, but the bigger, larger cities across the country are all are everybody's all unionized. unionized at this point. Yeah, that makes sense. So as your company continued to scale and you guys started doing bigger and bigger productions, you decided to start this new company, the uh, the uh, VES uh, or uh, Veridity Entertainment Services. Um, you did that sort of in initially to deal with these situations where you were staffing in non-union areas. So do you mind talking a little bit about, I guess, the innovation and then let's get into the pivot? Yeah. So we, we decided to start another company uh, to hire crews in non-union markets and also um, offer our clients that were coming into our union markets a service where, uh, and, and especially in New York, because there's a, there's a lot of um, employee laws where if you're traveling in, if you're working in the New York metropolitan area, you have to be trained in sexual harassment. You have to be trained in um, work workplace harassment. All these different laws that are in effect. That if you're traveling in and you're you don't have the certification the client could be liable uh, for a lawsuit from the state of New York. So what we were saying was, you let us know who you're bringing in, we'll handle the payroll, we'll train them, obviously for a fee, and we'll train them, monitor it, and make sure it's all taken care of. Uh, and that way we take the liability off, uh, off, off of these the companies. Yeah. Okay. And, and so... Uh, and yeah, then, and then, so, then COVID happened. Yeah, I was going to say from that period, it wasn't long before COVID happened. And uh, this is always something I, I really admire is when people can do this pivot, right? Whether it's a, a personal journey and you have a career pivot and you decide to change what you're doing, or, you know, in this case, you guys were trying to establish a business. I don't know how long you were able to work on it prior to COVID. Maybe you can explain, but, you know, and then out of nowhere, the whole world changed. So yep. I wonder if you just sort of talk about that experience. Yeah, I, maybe we started in October of 19, 2019, and then COVID happened in 2020. So um, I, I knew that uh, live streaming was out there, right? I, I didn't know much about it at the time in, in March 2020 when everything got shut down. Uh, and then my first company, HJZ Productions, was hired by West Point. Uh, to produce the graduation of the cadets, which was going to take place in June. We hired everybody from the producer to the director, to the technical crew, everyone involved. We rented the TV truck, everything. So when I was speaking to, to the director who he wanted for the, um, his technical director, he said he needed his guy, Jamie. And I said, and, and Jamie, he gave me Jamie's contact information. And I'm like, well, if he lives in New York, I got to know who he is. And I had no idea who this guy was. And he had an 818 area code. And um, to me, that meant he lived in California. And I'm like, why do I want to bring someone in from California when all of my guys in New York are sitting home not working for the last three months? And he's like, I, I got to have my guy. So something in my gut said, trust, trust this, go with your instinct, follow your gut, don't put up an argument, just go with it. 
So I meet this guy, Jamie, we bring him in to do the show. And it turns out he was on the forefront of live streaming. I picked his brain. I I got all the information I could possibly get out of him. And uh, then um, I taught myself a ton of stuff based on what he had taught me. And he's one of my closest friends to this day. And then I went to the rabbi at the temple where I belong. And I said, you know, you're not going to be able to do services the way you normally or have done them. We're going to need to live stream. And, and we went out and purchased um, cameras and all the equipment necessary to live stream the services. He was one of the only temples in the, in the area in, or in the state for mat- that matter that was able to live stream so early on. And while we were setting up the temple, I, I got that call from that client that I had told you about earlier that they needed to do all these interviews. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning of the company. And one, one, that one job and that, well, that one idea at the temple turned into a lot of uh, different live streams from concerts to cooking shows. So, uh, I mean, it, this is like the story of the right place, right time, right scenario. You know, yeah. like you, you had the, you met the guy a, and he kind of got you the, the insight on the, the streaming tech and then COVID happens because because of COVID, you are able to take that tech and apply it. And then um, you're applying it in, in your temple or religious services. And then the, the person who's going to pay you the big bucks for it reaches out about it. Um, I can't tell you how many times weird stuff like that has happened to me where, you know, I'm learning this tech and all of a sudden I have to apply it in real life or this happens. And, um, you know, we were... Uh, I did a few medical live streams uh, in Utah and I'd never done them before, but the fact that I had had this podcast going, I was able to apply what I was learning with the podcast and how to, you know, handle the audio, the video and all the different moving parts and be able to get it mixed down through a, what, what was the, what was the software you're using at the time, right? What was it called? We use, we use VMix. Okay. Yeah. We were using Wirecaster back then. Wirecast, okay. but we were, we were able to do overlays and do all the different things that, you, you know, make it look professionally produced. And it was yeah. literally, you know, a webcam and, and the software and, and just being able to, I don't know. I, I it, it, it's just a really cool story. And I like how uh, you. you were able to um, pivot like that so quickly. And the fact that you, um, you know, your industry put you in the position where the people that needed it would reach out to you. Whereas like, I'm sure there's a lot of people that could do the same thing, but you have the contacts already built to where it kind of just, it was a good pivot for the situation and for your clients. You were able to. Yeah. One thing I was taught very, very early on was like, take every phone number, every business card, um, and this is obviously in 2000 before the LinkedIn, the social platforms, and everything. So um, I developed and have a large network uh, of people, um, whether it's client, you know, people, potential clients or potential freelancers. So um, I try to use that to my to my advantage. Yeah. No, it is cool too. Just, you know, like you're saying, just sort of how these pieces fell into place. You know, I mean, for so many people, I think there are, you know. I mean, even now, if you're looking at sort of, you know, economic conditions and all this other stuff, there are a lot of people who are afraid, but truth be told, it's probably going to be an opportunity for some people. Like this is going to be where somebody starts at the bottom and then they grow exponentially when things return or, you know, whatever. So, I mean, to be able to catch a wave or or sort of catch a trend, you know, early, because what's interesting is, so, I mean, live streaming obviously existed prior to COVID. Uh, it, It became very popular during COVID and obviously technology and things did a lot of work over those couple of years, you know, got really good, you know, so the platforms got better, internet bandwidth got better, everything got better. And so, uh, so it became more accessible. And so, but now it's, you know, it's a very serious part of our, you know, television production landscape, right? I mean, they've always done remotes and things like that, but now they can do things so much you know, cheaper because the technology leveled up, they can, you know, instead of having to send a whole crew, they could hire a company like yours to just send a package out and and manage this interview, for example. And so I think it's really interesting how the business, I guess, you know, sort of not only grew, but then also sort of compressed, you know, and and became a, a more, 
I guess, organized or coordinated system that will now level up the, the type of production we used to do, right? Now you don't require a camera operator and a sound guy and a boom operator and all this stuff. You know, now you can just do it with a laptop and a camera and still get more or less production quality results. Yeah, I mean, it, you, it can be done both ways, right? So like how you just explained, we can do do shows that way. We've done it with athletes um, uh, in their hotel rooms with our contributor kits. Or we did, uh, for example, we just did a show, a uh, corporate event uh, two days ago. Um, it was, ha- we handled the part in New York City, but there was a part that was in Amsterdam. We had three cameras, a lot of lights, a lot of audio, uh, this broadcast could have aired on network television. That was the quality of it. It was expensive to produce for the client and put on, but um, it was still ultimately a live stream. It was live streamed over the internet from New York to Amsterdam and then globally out of Amsterdam. Well, so and you, it, you see it too, especially down with, with conferences. And, you know, I mean, there's all these conferences now that, you know, went remote during COVID. Then they've come back out, but they've kept this remote component, right? right? So there's this thing that seems to be following a lot of the conventions anyway, is that they do these productions now, right? And, you know, if you're a, an event operator, maybe if you have a giant event, you would have had had the stat or had the money to, to pay for something like a full-blown television production crew. But nowadays, you know, you could really simplify that operation or make it, I guess, I, I think what I like about it is that it's so accessible even to smaller organizations, Right. You know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, with union pricing and everything, it kind of is what it is, you know, maybe in your world. But it does seem that the technology has facilitated something that is now more accessible than it was prior. Because yes. you know, pre-pandemic, the uh, MO would have been, hey, let's send a crew out, you know, bare bones. We need a, you know, a sound guy or an audio mixer. We need a cameraman. We need somebody to help put up a light, you know, these kinds of things. You know, so there would have been a requirement for that crew just, you know, only a few years ago. And right. now, you know, even if that's still the optimal you know, now we've got these other options, I think, that make it more accessible for smaller organizations. You know, obviously you were going to your temple. So I imagine, you you know, you didn't probably go full blast on those guys. It was probably, you know, what they could afford and that, that kind of thing. But for other churches or other organizations or youth groups or whatever, like, you know, now there's an option, right? They could they can Absolutely. share their message with the whole world using these technologies and the things that, that were sort of born or, or I guess sort of fixed during, during uh, COVID. And so I think that, you know, even if it's just one more uh, feather in your cap, I think it's a, a pretty cool offering to be able to share with people. Thank you. Yeah, I, it, we, we've worked uh, small, small, cheap events, you know, low cost events, but still giving it um, a production value, uh, a very high production value to very, very, very expensive events, giving the same production value. So to your point, it doesn't matter if you're a big sm- big or small company, how much money you have, it could still, there's still a way to achieve a certain production value and make it look a certain way. Uh, And there's something about that. And I assume part of it is because of your background in actual production. Like you're not Mm -hmm. a guy who just came in as a, as a dreamer, you're a guy that did the work. Right. And uh, Mike is sort of that way. And he and I used to have a a concert production company and we'd put on concerts and stuff in Arizona and Idaho. And, and, uh, but our shows always had, because of Mike's music background and and in the uh, DJ realm, we always had the coolest lights. We always had the best sound. We always had all the cool equipment, right? So even for these little, you know, garage band, punk band that, you know, no one will ever hear again, you know, those guys got the same kind of production that somebody at a much bigger venue or a much bigger name would have had. And so, uh, so it was really a, a fun thing because part of the allure was coming to work with us as professionals, just because that was our ethic, right? That was just our way of doing That's awesome. it. And so it sounds like that's sort of your realm too. You know, you're mm-hmm. a consummate professional and I'm not going to give you short shrift just because the package is inexpensive or just because you can't afford high dollar, you know, how can we make the best of this, you know, production, whatever it is. Right. Abs- absolutely. And a lot of times we'll, um, and because this is new to people, this, the, the live stream will even, you know, give them the full, the full production value with all the big cameras and everything just to prove the concept so they can see what it looks like. Um, and we'll throw the, sometimes we'll throw the equipment in for free just to show them this is what can really be done, uh, you know, moving forward. I've done that before. I, I um, there was a, an open mic night where they were, they hired me to come in and um, build a audio system form for the venue to where it's, 
it's just built in. They don't have to set up a sound system anymore. They just plug in the stage box and the mics and they're good to go and walk around with the iPad. And uh, <laughs> so they had been doing their, their open mic night for like three or four years. And I got the sound system installed. And then the first night that they had the sound system, I brought in lighting and I did like a big kind of just, it was St. Patty's day. So it was like a, nice did big lights did big you know i recorded it for him we had a photographer come in and and capture it and i was like this is the difference between you know like just setting up a speaker on a stand and actually producing an event and this is what you can get in return and everyone still talks about that night to this day um granted they don't have a budget to do it every time but it, it was right. it was one of those things where it's like this is what you could have if you want to apply yourself a little bit more yeah. and right. i like doing that just to like kind of open their eyes a little bit like you know if you just you know do a little bit more you can have a little bit more <laughs> you know and, and sometimes it works and sometimes it's you know just a one one time off good event and so right. um yeah well and i think it's like a an ethic or a moral there right i mean there's so many people who and maybe it's not as popular now maybe i'm too old to know what's what's the deal now but i was always a believer in in sort of giving freely of myself and and you know i would give people sort of that try before you buy i know now everybody wants to be paid for an internship and all that kind of stuff but you know being able to offer a little extra or give a little more and sometimes at no cost or maybe even a little cost to yourself you know usually does you know I guess, show for, for how you are. Right. It's sort of a, you know, shows your ethic that you're a go the extra mile kind of guy. So I think it's pretty yeah. valuable. Um, I wanted to talk to you, Howie, a little bit more. You mentioned earlier in your story about um, trusting your gut and basically making an, an assumption that you were, you know, this is the right decision. We're going to go forward. You illustrated trusting your gut again, a second time, you know, as you uh, made the pivot into this live streaming realm. So I wonder if you could just talk about your experience in trusting your gut and like how that could maybe be passed along as sort of like an ethic or maybe something that somebody that people could install in themselves, you know, to maybe develop the confidence required to do that. Because I think so many people, I mean, obviously we've all heard that type of language before, right? Trust your gut, go with your gut. You know, we've all heard this type of stuff before, but I think it's a real challenge for a lot of people who A, aren't secure in themselves as an individual, or B, aren't secure in themselves. Maybe they they don't think their work's as good as it, maybe it really is, or maybe they come off better to others, but they're really hard on themselves or whatever. So for those kind of people, it might be a real challenge to, I guess, go with their gut. And so I wonder if you talk a little bit about just sort of what it was in you that allowed you to take that. And maybe it's just you know willingness to take risk or whatever, but I wonder if you could elaborate on, it, on that at all. Yeah, um, I, I'm not a huge risk taker. But I know that if you hem and haw, trying to make a decision, writing down the pros, writing down the cons, it, it take forever. And the decision, the opportunity to make the decision will pass you by. So um, I, I, I that, that's what I do. I, I, I just have like this inner feeling inside when a major decision um, comes about that I, I I, I just, I make it, I don't spend a lot of time on, you know, which, what to do, which way to go. I, I just make the decision and live, and live with it. Well, and tell me if this resonates with you, because I think, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not in video production specifically, but I work in advertising and design and I've spent my whole life as a, as a designer and artist and, and have grown to like, you know, high level creative director at this point. And, um, you know, I, I know for me, when it comes to things to do with my work, like, I have confidence in that, right? I'm a professional right. at that and I, and I feel very good about doing that. And sometimes I think that skill set can transfer to to other things, right? I have this maybe outsized level of of confidence in my ability to do X and so just it comes sort of naturally to just kind of go with something, right? Because like I'm confident. I I trust my judgment. And in your case, you know, you're a 25 plus year vet as a cameraman at this point, camera operator. And um, you know, so you too are highly skilled, highly, you know, whatever. And you came into your business as a highly skilled individual. And so I wonder if maybe that development of skill is part of what lends to your ability to go with your gut, so to speak. It, it could be. And I, I would always find, you know, over the course of my career, I shot hundreds and hundreds of football games um, and other, a lot of other events, a lot of 22 years of Kentucky derbies. And part of your, part of my success is being, or putting my, I should say like this, putting myself in the right place at the right time to get the shot or to get the replay of the touchdown or 
the winning horse or trainer or whatever. So I, I think maybe that is all intertwined uh, in terms of like trust, trusting my gut, whether it's putting myself in the right place or trusting my gut to make the right decision. Right. Yeah. So maybe it's a little more instinctual even than a, mm-hmm. a decision to trust your gut. And maybe this is, is the, I guess, sort of creative part of the brain, right? Like you're, you're yeah. sort of anticipating what might be coming next. Cause I, I mean, Mike made the point earlier, but I mean, it really even ties to your sort of entrepreneurial career and, and being able to be in the right place at the right time and sort of see what was coming down the pipe as far as what video production might look like during COVID. Right. Um, you know, n- none of us like to talk about it or ever bring it up, but in in the industry, or as far as like audio, video, lighting, um, there's always those, oh, crap, I forgot this, or oh, crap, this happened, or oh, crap, it's raining and we weren't prepared for the rain, or this or that. In a 20-year career, you've had to have a few of those moments, and no one likes to talk about it. I'll tell, I'll tell one of mine real quick. I had a 30 by 30 foot light roof with a bunch of moving heads bunch of speakers hanging off it all that all that fun stuff and i got everything set up i go to plug in the light controller and i've got a five pin to three pin dmx adapter and so i had everything set up everything dialed in you know dmx channel set and i couldn't connect it to my uh my controller and um luckily i had a buddy that was close by brought one over we were able to program get it saved today kind of thing have you ever had any experiences like that where it's like you show up and camera's broken or, you know, truck doesn't have the right thing you need in it or anything? Yeah, like I, I don't remember the shoot, but um, we showed up to shoot an interview and we had no tape in the kit. That was before. <laughs> before that was, actual that was, digital. Yeah, we had no videotape. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's without a doubt. And we have this big press conference coming up next week and we're shipping out of a lot of equipment. So all day I've been going through my mind, what am I forgetting? So we don't have one of those moments. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely happened. And uh, I do everything possible to try to make that not happen again. Well, and that's that's one of those, I mean, like when you're, it's your first year, first two or three years stuff like that's going to happen i remember one time i showed up to the very first year second year i was djing i showed up to a gig and i had um i was going from quarter inch jacks to xlr into the, the amplifier and i didn't have no it was rca to quarter inch into the amplifier and i forgot those cords and i would i mean like it i you can't power the speakers without the amplifier if you can't get from right. the mixer to the end so i ended up cutting a speaker cable in half and then sticking one end in and taping it on and it worked it got me through the thing but when you make those mistakes those mistakes are what make sure they don't happen in the future and yes. after you know 10 15 years of doing it you're going to have a few of those mistakes and those mistakes are what's going to make you a professional in the long run if you stick with it and um you know i've I, whenever I talk to someone in the industry that actually works with equipment and works with the tech and cables and this and that, I always ask that question because we've all done it at some point. We've all done I, something stupid. I always overpack. I'd yeah. rather have more than I need than, than not redundancy enough. is key. I mean, I'll have three or four of the same cord just in case you get a short or you have a problem or this and that. And it, it's stuff you learn over the years of doing doing it so Absolutely. have you ever had any uh as a camera operator have you been like sideline and been tackled oh, I've, <laughs> I've, I've been in the hospital three times i've had really? three concur- <laughs> th- two one in college football at um notre dame one in the nfl and i have no idea where i even was and then um the first the very first time i was hurt um I got hit in the head right here with a line drive at uh, uh, Shea Stadium where the Mets used oh, to play before man. they moved to City Field. At least it was kind of <laughs> glancing off instead of direct in the forehead. Or- well, the doctor <laughs> said, uh, I remember like uh, another inch over, he said it would have killed me on the spot because as you get uh, more towards the center, your skull gets softer. Oh, oh man. Geez. Yeah, no, that's yeah. brutal. Yeah, my son is a a giant New York Giants fan. So if you were at least tackled by one of his guys, he'd be really excited for you. <laughs> I, I, I really have no idea who the NFL ac- the accident was with, but the college one was Navy versus Notre Dame. 
Oh, how fun. That's a big game. That's fun. Um, I wanted to ask you one more sort of business question. We're starting to get to the end of the show, and I just wanted to ask you one more thing. Um, So we talked just moments ago about this idea of, you know, sort of you being a tactician, right? You're you're the camera operator. You're the you're the guy with the skills in this business. And I'm asking this maybe a little bit selfishly because I'm sort of in the same boat. But you you mentioned way back at the beginning of the conversation that you thought early on to hire somebody uh, to help you with staffing and to help with running the office, doing the business of the business. And that was an, a particularly interesting thing for me because I think a lot of entrepreneurs go into a business basically as an extension of their freelance career. This is what I did, and I think a lot of people do that. And um, you know, basically, they they have a skill and they can parlay that into an organization. But I think for a lot of us, myself included. We don't have the wherewithal to recognize that we're not good at the business. You know, maybe we don't like doing it, but we slog, you know, slog through it or or that kind of thing for a long time. But it seems like you at least had the, I guess, sense of being that you knew well enough early on that this wasn't my thing. I should hand that off. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about that, just being able to hand over the responsibility of the management of the business so that you could continue to be in your role as a tactician or as a practitioner in the business. Yeah, that it took a lot, right? Because trusting someone with your money, um, um, finding the right person. Uh, so, in, and the person that we hired, Lori, who's like my second wife, happened to be one of my wife's best friends who worked in finance uh, before she left that job and had kids and everything. So she was like the perfect person for this. Um, she wanted to work from home, which this is what the job required uh, was, you know, was able to provide and uh, not be a hundred percent full-time, but uh, just about full-time. And so she was a perfect person and way smarter than I am with numbers and things like that. So it just made perfect sense. And since she was so close to my wife, we felt that we trusted her a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's critical, right? That, that ability to trust, because I mean, especially if you're going to be the tactician, you're going to be not watching the ball uh, necessarily minute to minute, right? You're going to leave this right. in the hands of somebody that you trust. You know, I, I happen to know of a, a family business that, you know, did something like that, where it was entrusted to somebody else who turned out to not be that trustworthy. And while, you know, the, the tactician was out doing his work, the business was in, you know, on fire behind him. And, uh, you know, so he didn't know until it was too late to fix the problem. And, uh, yeah. and so, yeah, I think that that trust is critical, but I'm also just really interested in that idea or that willingness to, to find somebody to do that, or I guess to have the knowledge that you needed to do that. Because like, I think, especially for a lot of, you know, in, uh, solo operators or, or young entrepreneurs, you know, that are, are maybe going into a, or starting a business based on their skill or their craft. Um, it seems like there's also this sort of scarcity mindset, I guess, where it's like, you know, I don't really have enough money to pay me and you, so I'll just do it all. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so just sort of naturally the inclination is you don't hire anybody, you don't get the help. When in reality, by having the right person in that position, you're now better able to go find work or to set up more operations or in your case, you know, plan more events or whatever it is. And so, uh, so I think it's really a, a good insight, you know, especially for people who are maybe in the situation to, you know, think about those early hires because they're so critical. Well, yeah, I had a business coach uh, that also taught me, um, you know, stay in your lane, do the three to 5% of what you're good at. And if you're working in the business, you're not working on the business. You just kind of, kind of stay kind of flat, right? You got to be working three, two, three months ahead of where you are now. Uh, Otherwise, when those two and three months come, you you might not have any business. So uh, I try to, although I'm involved in the day to day, I try not to be. Uh, I try to be working on the business as much as as possible, not in the business um, as much as possible. Yeah, I think that's right, and I, I think it's a challenge for a lot of people, you know, because it is the inclination to be working in the business. I know that you know, yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm still really bad about it. <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, so I can, I can relate. But, and yeah. when I say to, you know, Jen and Lori, you guys handle it. I don't even want to know about it. It's not, I'm not being rude. It, and it's not that I don't want to know about it. I feel like I don't need to know about it. Right. You, yeah. You know. Well, yeah. and with, with your wife in places like a, you know, if she, she's kind of looking over her shoulder a little bit, it's a little bit easier for you to kind of step back and, do the other yeah. side of the business. Uh, and Whereas, yeah, I was going to say you know, that too, you your, know, in the case of having a, a partner or a spouse involved in your organization, I mean, if you can basically trust them with anything, 
and, right. you know, and, and the incentives are sort of aligned, right? I mean, if you can't make the house payment this month, then we both lose our house. So <laughs> we're both on board, you know? So, uh, and, so I think that and she's way smarter than I am. So, yeah. and, <laughs> and I know I'm not a, a past a certain time of day. We, we try not to talk about business uh, just because it makes life easier. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. True. Well, cool. So uh, we're getting down sort of to the wire here. Do you want to take a minute and just sort of let people know where they can learn a little bit about more, a little bit more about you online, maybe engage with you in person via, you know, social platforms or wherever you may be active and also just how they might engage with you in business if they chose to? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn at Howard Zales, uh, Instagram at Howie Zales. Um, my website uh, is HowieZales.com, and then each business has a website off of HowieZales.com. So uh, that's the best way to reach me. Cool. Perfect. I love it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. I'm super grateful. Yep, absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every weekend. We'll see you guys next time.